1923, the United States Army Air Corps did something that had never been done in human history. Two biplanes in June of that year linked together mid-flight so that one could pass aviation fuel to the other in something now known as air refueling. And they did so on that day for a very particular reason, because their mission was to break records, range records, allowing a plane to fly further than one ever had, and endurance records, allowing a plane to fly longer than one ever had. And indeed, they broke records on that day, and it proved a very important point, that in order to best achieve your mission, you need to stay connected to the source of your power. I'm gonna admit something that a self-respecting F-22 pilot normally would never admit, that without those big, slow, lumbering, air-refueling aircraft, then even the world's most capable aircraft, the F-22, couldn't achieve its mission because it didn't have the range and it wouldn't have the endurance. Because in order to best achieve your mission, you need to stay connected to the source of your power. The Bible in John 15, verse 5, Jesus says this, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. The dichotomy is powerful there. If you stay connected to the source of your power, Jesus, then you can bear much fruit, which means you can do things that last and have meaning and have purpose. But if you do not, then the Bible doesn't just say you can only do a little. The Bible says that you can do nothing. Nothing of significance, nothing of substance, nothing of true meaning or purpose, because in order to achieve our mission in 2023 as Christians in the United States of America on Veterans Day, we need to stay connected to the source of our power. Let's pray. Lord God, I do thank you so much for this message. I ask that you would bless the message to follow. Bless us this evening, Lord. We thank you so much for this great opportunity. And we thank you for a very special Veterans Day service on a prayer meeting that has been going on for seven and a half years straight as we pray for our nation and our leaders in revival. Please bless tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Point number one is about the self-sufficiency trap or the challenges we face as Americans in 2023, especially sometimes as veterans, where we know how to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, that no matter what is going on in our lives, we believe that we've got it, that we can handle it. But the truth of the matter is that we need to ultimately realize that we are so needful of humbly relying upon the Lord. God says in James 4, 6, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Sometimes we fail to recognize that we get into desperate situations in our lives because we didn't start praying and now we feel compelled to pray only because of the situation that we've gotten ourselves into because we failed to pray. And God gives us some antidotes to those challenges of pride in our lives. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou hast received it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? Everything you have, everything I have, comes from God. That is the raw material and the opportunities and the experiences and the relationships that allow us to use the raw material. Everything is from God. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And in order to achieve our mission, to best achieve our mission, we need to depend on him through humility. Point number two. We need to rely on him through prayerful humility. On June 5th, 1944, General Dwight D. Eisenhower made the decision that the next morning would be D-Day, the invasion of mainland Europe by allied forces to ultimately end World War II in the European theater. And he made that decision and then he did two very interesting things. First, he wrote a letter that ultimately claimed full blame for a failed invasion in case it failed, a step of humility. But then he did something that was recorded in his journal that we must remember vividly today. 
In his journal, he wrote this, after making the decision for those hundreds of thousands of Allied troops to invade the next morning, he wrote in his journal, there's nothing that we could do but to pray desperately. There's nothing that we could do but to pray desperately. He realized that no matter what power he had, no matter what influence he had, that the only way that they could achieve the outcome that they expected and needed was to pray desperately. Our Lord and Savior did exactly that. The night before his crucifixion in Luke 22, we see it recorded starting in verse 41. And he, Jesus, was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he had the most consequential decision of his earthly ministry, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, all man, but at the same time all God, he didn't necessarily in his flesh want to carry out his mission because he knew how painful the next 24 hours would be. But in order to strengthen himself, he realized that the best thing that he could do, all God and all man, was to pray and to ultimately pray desperately and to yield his will to his Father. And as a result, he was empowered and equipped through humble prayer. And just like Eisenhower, and certainly just like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in order to achieve our mission, we must embrace prayerful humility. We also need to embrace national humility. It is so vitally important to realize that this nation was founded on a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. In fact, that line is the last one in our Declaration of Independence. Those very brave, very educated, very courageous, very skilled men who signed the Declaration of Independence realized that it was all for naught unless they had a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We often think about Veterans Day as starting at the end of World War I, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month when the guns fell silent during World War I. But to some extent, the first Veterans Day happened not at the end of World War I, but 403 years ago today. Because veterans of a 66-day perilous journey across the northern Atlantic Ocean found themselves in the safety of Plymouth Harbor. And before they set foot on dry ground, they authored and signed our nation's first constitution known as the Mayflower Compact. And in that document, they described what they were there to do, why they were there here in the New World, and how they would conduct themselves. Their mission was to bring glory to God and advance the Christian faith, written in that first constitution of the United States. The way they were going to do that was to covenant and combine themselves together. But it was ultimately a document that was a constitution, but a document of humility that was echoed in our nation's Declaration of Independence. And we are reminded in Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. An element of American history that often is neglected to be taught in schools, certainly public schools, was what happened on our nation's first day of inauguration. The inauguration under the Constitution that took place in Lower Manhattan on April 30th, 1789, where George Washington became our nation's first president, and he swore his oath and ended it with the voluntary word, so help me God, an act of humility. And then he went inside the Federal Hall in Lower Manhattan, and he gave what was a political speech, but ultimately was far more of a Christian sermon than anything we would hear as a political discourse today. And then he did something that is interesting that we must remember in our nation's history. As a part of a joint resolution of Congress, it was mandated that the first act of the new government under the Constitution was for the president and the vice president and the House of Representatives and the Senate walk down Wall Street together to a Christian church to pray together and to worship together. That was to be based on a joint resolution of Congress, the first act of the new government. They signed the Constitution. They knew what the First Amendment said, and they had no problem with doing that as the first act of the new government. 
And that was a sign ultimately of appreciation for what God had done to birth this nation. And ultimately, it was a sign of reliance on the protection of divine providence. We need revival in this nation so desperately. Second Chronicles 7.14 gives us the recipe for both personal and national revival. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It starts with humility. It starts with an understanding that we can't do it on our own. We can't bring about the protection or the power or the prosperity on our own. We cannot. It comes starting with an acknowledgement that it all comes from the Lord God himself. And the blessing of this meeting for the last seven and a half years in part is an acknowledgement that it is not us as individuals or us as a people group that can see this land return back to where it belongs, but ultimately it can only come through the power of our Lord. And the only way that we can achieve our mission is by relying upon him and staying connected to him. And finally, there is a power in personal humility. One of my heroes is a guy named Gary Bikirk. He passed away about a year and a half ago, Medal of Honor recipient, medic during the Vietnam War. And when you read his Medal of Honor citation, you see things that you can't even fathom or imagine. The camp came under attack, and as a medic, he ran out into the withering fire to care for and tend to and rescue those who had been struck. And he did so time and again. And he was struck by bullets, and he was struck by shrap shrapnel, but ultimately he kept going until his wounds were so bad that he passed out and he was tended to. A guy like that theoretically could rely on himself more than any single individual that I have ever come to know. And I got to meet him a couple of times. A great Christian man, ultimately the chaplain of the Medal of Honor Society before he passed away. Gary Bikirk's life verses come from Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. He could rely on anything, himself, his background, his courage, and his strength. But Gary Biker gives us a map of personal humility that the only thing ultimately we should glory in is a knowledge of the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Lord is an amazing Lord, an amazing God, an amazing Savior. And I am so mindful of the fact that he was so countercultural in how he demonstrated that personal humility that it is important for us to grasp the truths that he provided to us. One of my favorite leadership books is B.P. McCoy's The Passion of Command, a colonel in the United States Marine Corps. By the way, happy birthday yesterday to the Marines among us. I figured you'd say that because you always do. And this individual, McCoy, was a battalion commander in the heaviest fighting of Iraqi freedom. And he had a large number of men under his command, and he wrote this great book. And on the inside cover is a warning label. Only a Marine would have a warning label on the inside cover of his book, and McCoy does. And this is what it says. Without genuine concern, this is all worthless. Without genuine concern, this is all worthless. And what he means by that is that his book will be worthless to you. Go ahead and stop reading. If you don't have genuine concern for the people of the mission, his book will be worthless to you. But he also means you will be a worthless leader if you don't have genuine care and concern for your people and the mission. Fortunately, our Lord and Savior had genuine care and concern for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What is it, what is it about this counterculturalism that is so striking? Jesus says this when inquired about leadership in Matthew 20, verse 26 and 28. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. 
And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Personal humility. Leadership that is countercultural, that has genuine care and concern for you and me. And in order for us to achieve our mission, we need to stay connected to the source of our power. Back to the verses of the day, John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If we do not stay connected to the source of our power, then we will never break endurance records. We will never break range records. And we will never be able to do what God has called us to do. In order to achieve our mission, we must stay connected to the source of our power. Let's pray. Lord God, I do thank you so much for the Supreme Prayer Meeting. I thank you so much that on February of 2016, on the day that Justice Scalia died, that this church and a few individuals met here to pray for our country and our leaders. And this has been a weekly meeting ever since. I thank you for the humility that is demonstrated by that act, by this ministry. I thank you that the fact that that ministry was birthed is an indication of the truth that in order to achieve our mission, we must stay connected to the source of our power. Lord, we beg you for revival. We beg you for personal revival. We beg you for church-wide revival. And we beg you for national revival, Lord. And we ask and pray that as we consider this magnificent location at the steps of the Supreme Court, across the street from the U.S. Capitol, and down the road from the White House, that the leaders that occupy these buildings make such consequential decisions, but they need you desperately. We need you desperately. And I ask and pray, Lord, that you please would bring revival to our land. Help us, Lord, to remember the truths of our founding that relied upon you for the birth of this nation and for the growth of this nation. And if we are going to have a bright future in the United States of America, then we must desperately rely upon you. We ask and pray for revival. We ask and pray that you would continue this meeting into the future as a sign of our subservience to you. And we love you and thank you for how you demonstrated such genuine care and concern for us. And we ask that we could do so for the world around us in your name and in Jesus' power, I pray. Amen.